All right. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I know for some of you, it's good morning. For some of you, it's good afternoon. We have people from 14 different countries here on this webinar. So welcome. Today is going to be all about the GMAT verbal section. We're also going to talk about MBA strategies. We are going to actually have a very special guest at the end of the workshop tonight. Uh, J.D. Clark, an executive director of admissions and recruitment from the Ivy Business Schools at Western University, uh, one of the toughest schools to get into. He, uh, J.D. is going to come and share with you some of the application strategies, but before that, we are going to learn how we can ace the GMAT. We'll talk about the verbal section, but we'll also talk overall about how to study. And if you've been here two weeks ago and we talked about the math section, I'll give you some of the ideas, some of the strategies that you haven't heard already. And of course, if you haven't been to our master fresher class, then we are going to have another one exactly two weeks from now, same time on December 15th. Thanks so much for letting me know where you're coming from or where you are in your studies. Like I mentioned, we do have people with all kinds of different backgrounds, re literally from all over the world. I am going to end the poll right now, just so that we can proceed with our class. Uh, so let me stop uh, right at this moment. And we're going to delve directly into talking about the GMAT verbal. Now, most specifically, I want to make sure that you get the most out of this class. Right? And I also want to make sure that we have the right understanding of what really is the GMAT verbal section. Because many people call the GMAT verbal an English section. And that's a bit of a misconception or maybe a huge misconception because it's not really about knowing English. And I think you probably already know this by now. And if you don't, you are going to know this very soon. So. To demonstrate this, perhaps, I want to start with a very small lesson in French. So if anybody here speaks French on this call, could you please tell me what is the French word for to take? Just put it in the chat box and also let me know that we can interact here. Yes, thank you. It, it's prompt. And what is the French word for to learn? What's French for to learn? It's apprendre. Exactly, it's apprendre. So in the French language, to learn and to take, these words have the same root. So therefore, as we're going to be doing some exercises tonight, please participate. Do whatever you think is necessary, except please do not Google these questions as I give you questions from past exams. I know we all sit in front of our computer, so it's really easy to Google and just simply figure out what the answer is. That kind of defeats the purpose of the learning. The goal is not to get a question right here on this class. The goal is to get these questions right on the real exam. And of course, the questions are not going to look exactly the same. So please don't Google these questions. Do whatever you think is necessary. I will be giving you limited time. This is going to be a simulation of how things are going to be on a real test. Of course, I won't give you a lot of questions. We'll be doing some, a few questions all throughout this workshop and I'll be teaching you some of the strategies as well. So the first question that we're going to do is a critical reasoning question. I will give you approximately one minute to read this question, try to make sense of it, maybe even try to answer it. So here's the question.
All right. So that's been about a minute, maybe even a little bit longer. I won't ask you yet whether you can answer the question. Obviously, I haven't given you the answer choices, but I would just want to ask you, over this time that I gave you, how many times did you read this passage? Just put it in the chat box. All right, yeah, most of you are saying two, three or four times. And after reading it two or three or four, some of you five times, could you honestly say that you understand everything in this passage? Okay, yeah, th thanks for being honest. Uh, I have to tell you, it took me a really long time understanding what's going in this passage. And of course, on the day of the test, we only have about a minute and a half to two minutes to deal with this question. So. I've given you just that time to read this question. Let's maybe see if we can answer this question without fully understanding what it's saying. Let me show you the answer choices. Please go through the answer choices now. You've already seen this question. You've read it a few times. So go through the answer choices and see if you can pick an answer that looks the best to you. Here are five answer choices. And I will launch just a very quick poll, similar to what we've done already where you're gonna be able to share the answer with me and I will know when you're ready by looking at your answers. I'll give you 15 more seconds to choose an answer. So even if you don't know what the answer is, doesn't matter, just choose whatever looks the best to you. All right. So I do have to admit only about half of the people here on this call actually chose the answer. And that tells me that half of the people, so half of you, half of everybody on this call doesn't really know how to answer this question. That's okay. Uh, in fact, let me share the results with you. So we've had selections for all of the answer choices. We had an equal number of people for A and B, and then the fewest number of people for C, and then D and E are pretty second close. So maybe just for the sake of our discussion, let me start with C, because if that was the least popular answer, let's try to understand why. Well, let's go back to the original passage. Notice how the question to the passage was asking the statement above in boldface please plays which of the following roles in the ethicist's argument. Now, by the way, who is an ethicist? Does anybody know who is an ethicist by any chance? Just put it in the chat box. Who is this person? Have you ever met somebody whose profession was an ethicist? And most importantly, if you're trying to get into a business school, do you have to be a professional ethicist? Absolutely not. Now, an ethicist is somebody who studies ethics. And I think you can understand by now that you don't really need to be an expert in ethics. In fact, I think you have to be ethical if you're applying to a business school. That's really important. But you don't have to be an expert. So maybe the GMAT isn't really asking us to understand what this person was saying. It's perhaps simply asking us to understand enough to answer this question. Notice how the question wasn't even about ethics. It was about the role of a certain statement in the argument. And if we want to understand the role of a statement in the argument, what we need to understand is the structure of an argument, right? 
The structure of an argument is something different from the content of the argument. We usually focus on the content when we read. And I'll, I'll give you a few examples and I'll tell you some, some of the strategies you could use to perhaps start thinking differently about how you read so that you could discover some of the better ways to read for the GMAT. But most of us, if we were to actually track the movement of your eyes, and unfortunately I cannot see you just like I would in a real class, but I can pre imagine as you were reading this passage, your eyes were slowing down on the words that we don't understand. For example, as you read the word, especially virtues or extinguishing all such desires, then your eye movements actually slow down because you needed to understand exactly what you were reading. And then often we would go back and read the same word again. So we're focusing on understanding what this person is trying to say. That's that important. The role of the statement is important. So we need to focus on the key words that tell us how this passage is organized. And believe it or not, that's as much as we need to understand here in this passage. And these are the words that we all know and we can easily understand that yet we just glance over them when we read for the first time. Notice how the person began with the words, it would be a mistake to say this ethicist. That means that somebody made a mistake and the ethicist thinks this person is wrong. Now, when I'm trying to say that something or somebody is wrong, I better explain why I believe that. Now, otherwise it would be just arguing for the sake of arguing. We need to argue by providing some support or as we call evidence to our claim. So the claim of this argument is somebody is wrong and ethicist is right in some sort of a thing. And the support to that argument is going to come right after it. The words for although it is true are actually introducing one of these evidences, one of this support. And there are different ways to use the evidence, but notice how the author here specifically uses the evidence to agree with some part of somebody's argument, but probably disagrees with the conclusion they're making. All right, notice how again, didn't even touch the subject of ethics. All we said is the author begins with a claim that somebody's wrong, but he or she is right, then provides some supporting evidence. And most specifically, the part in bold was that supporting evidence that the author agrees with because he or she said, although it is true. All right, let's see if this will help us answer the question. Let's go back to the answer choices. Let's start with C. There was the least popular answer. Very often it's actually the most popular answer uh, when I'm teaching this class live, actually the majority of the people are going to pick C. So let's take a look at C. C says it is a faulty coin. Wait a second, what is a faulty coin? Well, somebody's making a faulty coin, of course, because they also disagreed with it, but was the part in bold a faulty coin? The question was asking not about the whole argument, but just about the part in bold. So that is not the right answer because that part in bold is not a faulty claim. Let's take a look at D. D says, according to the argument, it is a commonly held opinion that is nevertheless false. Wait a second, the author said it's true. E says, it reports an observation that the argument claims is false. Huh, I can stop reading right now because I know it's not false. The author said it's true. So E is also wrong. Now we're down to two answer choices. These were the two most popular answer choices. We had a 50-50 chance between them and equal number of people who voted for each of the answer choices. And you know what, at this point, the best part of the argument, uh, and actually the best part of a multiple choice exam like the GMAT is that when we're down to two answer choices, we don't even have to analyze both. We can just look at one of them if it's right, it's right. If it's wrong, that means it's wrong. So the other one has to be right. Again, just for the sake of our discussion, I'd like to look at the one that's maybe a little simpler, a little shorter to read just to save some time. So I'm going to look at A. If it's right, it's right. If it's wrong, then it's B. The B has to be the right answer because we already eliminated three other answer choices. 
So A says the part in bold is a claim for which the argument attempts to provide justification. Is that true? Was this the claim? Not really. That is not the claim. The claim was before it. Therefore, A is wrong and B has to be right. Notice how we've done the analysis of this argument and we broke down the structure of this argument, but we haven't really understood the content of the argument. And that brings us to a very important point about the GMAT. And that is we don't have to be experts in any sort of a subject matter. In fact, if we were to ask ourselves this question, what really separates people who do really well on the GMAT, let's say somebody who scores 700, and people who don't, let's say somebody who scores maybe 500? The answer is going to be this. By the way, the answer is out in the open. You can find it on mba.com. You can find it in the official guide. Most people actually miss it because they don't pay attention. Here's the answer. The GMAT is going to be a different exam compared to almost any other exam because it is not going to test our knowledge of business. It's an exam to get into a business school. And if you can only imagine, if you're trying to get, let's say, into a physics school, you need to know some physics. But if you're trying to get into a business school, Believe it or not, you do not need to know any business and you don't need to know any other subject matter. You don't need to know ethics or anything like this. Instead, the GMAT exam will measure higher order reasoning skills, right? These are the skills that actually matter in the management classrooms in the 21st century workplace. So the skills is really what's important. Now, do you need to have some knowledge? Yes, actually not that much. You need to have some basic knowledge and operating, not an expert knowledge of geometry, algebra, statistics, and the English language to demonstrate a different type of reasoning skills. Again, who said this? People who created the test, the GMAC. So that really makes a difference. Instead of memorizing a lot of things, we are going to just develop a skill set. That is why when many people begin studying for the GMAT, they initially struggle or they get demotivated. And I'll share with you some interesting statistics about that. And the reason why it's for many people quite uncomfortable to study for the GMAT, it is because we haven't really been trained to think that way. Because when we were in school, and I don't know about you, but I certainly have heard this from my high school teachers, that knowledge is power. If I learn something, in school, if I do really well in that chemistry or that biology class, I will grow up and I'll be powerful and I'll be really successful. That's what they told me. And I don't know about you, but a lot of that knowledge that I learned in school isn't really something I remember anymore. So it doesn't really help me be more or less successful in life. And in fact, I wanna give you an example. A few years ago, I took up sailing. I don't know if you've ever uh, sailed a boat or been on a boat or maybe seen a boat. Uh, but in order to sail a boat, you need some skills because otherwise we can crash the boat into the shore. And the skills are pretty advanced, especially if you want to sail in open waters or in rough wind. Well, I could teach you everything about the theory of sailing a boat in approximately two hours. But would that make us good sailors? Would that help us win a Volvo Cup? Probably not. We have the knowledge, we're missing the skills. That's why it takes some time to develop your skills for the GMAT. And that's why there's a certain process that we are going to follow to actually develop these skills. And I'll talk about this process towards the end of our class. So to prepare for the test is really going to require some effort and dedication. And that is why when you're just beginning to think about preparing for the GMAT, you really, I would like to invite you to, un to understand how does it fit into your overall journey into your career goals? Obviously the GMAT isn't just the goal in itself, it's just a means to an end to get into a good business school. And even a business school is not a goal of itself, it's just to help you have a, perhaps a more successful, more rewarding, more fulfilling career. So one thing leads to the other. 
And if you understand that having a more successful career or maybe switching my career or maybe making more money or maybe making a big difference in the, in the lives of other people, or maybe it's just simply having a more secure job. If that's what's really important to you, then doing well on the GMAT is going to be the important steps to get there, right? And then as long as you understand how everything fits, then you are going to be so much more motivated and so much more likely to actually follow through and take the time to develop these skills. Now, how long does it actually take to develop the GMAT skills? Well, the answer is I'm going to give you a very simple MBA style answer. It depends. Now it depends on many factors and I'll tell you exactly on what factors as we go forward. But some people just simply walk into a test center and get a really good score right up front and some people struggle for years. Well, of course, the goal of this workshop and if we continue working together of our program will be of course to help you develop these skills within a shorter period of time. But if you've heard of anybody walking to a test center, just getting a good score with minimal preparation, then uh, probably these stories are true. In fact, I'm a testament to that story. This is my official score report. Studied for about two weeks. I just literally just did a couple practice tests. Didn't really prepare, just familiarized myself with the types of questions. Got to the test center, did my first my attempt and scored 99%. Now, the reason why I was able to do this as I realized much later, is that throughout my educational and my professional career, I was already developing the skills that were relevant to the GMAT. At that point, I didn't really know this. I didn't really pay attention. But as I went through my MBA career, and I do have my MBA, and uh, I, I've had a fairly successful corporate career when I graduated from my MBA program uh, 15 years ago, approximately, uh, what I realized is as I met many people who went through the same experience, that some of them also had an easier time prepared for the GMAT and some of them really struggled. And I got really curious because as I did really well, then I figured that maybe there's something that I could share and maybe there's something I could help other people as well. But I didn't really know how. So I started networking and I found people who were really, really good at what they do in terms of teaching the GMAT. Uh, some of uh, some of the people I met, uh, one of the uh, uh, one of these people, his name is Bobby. He actually lives uh, in the same city as I do. He was at some point named the best instructor in the world for at that time the largest GMAT prep company in the world. It was about 10, 12 years ago. And as I started speaking with uh, with these instructors, and some of them were also really, really experienced, what I realized is that almost every other GMAT course was teaching people. The theory of the GMAT was teaching people the strategies, but nobody was really teaching people how to think differently. Nobody was really focusing on helping people develop the skills. And that's why we saw an opportunity about 10, 12 years ago to put together a program that can literally take anybody from regardless of what backgrounds. And sometimes we have people come into our program with diagnostic scores of 200 to 300. And sometimes I go to these GMAT conferences and somebody would say, well, you know, sometimes I would get a student who would improve 200 points after my course. And I said, well, an average score improvement after our course is 200 points. Sometimes we get people improving 400 points. And it's really, um, again, all coming back to developing this skill. And I'll, I'll give you actually the strategy of how you can do this. Uh, so we've been teaching this course for about 12, 10, 12 years now, and uh, you the best part is you don't really need to have any special background. For example, Natasha uh, came to our course uh, about four years ago, literally off the plane. She landed here in this country and said, I got to do my GMAT. Uh, I need to prepare. She took a diagnostic test and it was 580. And uh, her biggest worry was the verbal section because she uh, wasn't a native English speaker. In fact, English was her third language. Uh, but she was really dedicated, really committed, came to our course, learned all the strategies, really learned how to think differently about uh, the classes. And as she can say uh, here also, she had a lot of fun. And as a result, she was able to score 96 percentile in the verbal section in just a couple of months. She got into the University of Toronto MBA program and uh, she actually uh, graduated and she has a very successful career right now. So if you 
feel like something's holding you back from doing the GMAT, or maybe English isn't your first, or maybe your second, or maybe even your third language. For me, it is the third language as well. Or maybe you feel like you're not a math person. Don't worry. The GMAT is really all about the skill set, and anybody can learn these skills. In fact, even today, you're going to walk away. Remember, it's all about ponder. It's all yours to take. So take as much as possible. Take these skills as we go forward. So today we started with a question to get you to challenge yourself to get outside of the comfort zone a little bit so that we could be in that learning zone. It's just outside of our comfort zone. We get slightly uncomfortable doing these questions. We'll do more questions tonight as well. We talked about what is that one thing that separates the 500 and 700 plus scores. And that's really all about the skill set. So as you're studying for the GMAT, think about what skills have I developed? Am I getting better on these skills? Not necessarily what I remember, but am I getting better? Am I improving? And we'll talk about, again, some of these skills today that specifically pertain to the verbal section. Of course, this is all going to be about the verbal section, so I'll share with you some of the verbal strategies that you can use right now. And we'll talk about some of the reasons why most people don't actually get these scores and how you can make sure that you can get very high scores. Now, we're all studying at home right now. I know it's sometimes hard to stay motivated as we're studying at home. So I'm going to share with you a few resources that are actually going to keep you motivated. And they'll be actually a lot of fun as you're studying for the GMAT. And then, as I mentioned towards the end, we're going to have some time for Q&A. And we'll have a guest from the Ivy Business School who's going to share with you some insider tips for MBA applications. Now, of course, if you're applying to different schools, then the same strategies are going to apply. It's not just if you apply to Ivy and these are going to be valuable. So I'd really like to encourage you to stay till the end today so you can learn these strategies that are going to help you put together your winning application. And also, of course, I know many of us are thinking about getting scholarships and getting some funding at this moment. So JD is going to talk about that as well. Now, one of the decisions one of the decision points that get into awarding a scholarship is, of course, a high GMAT score. So let's get back to talking about the GMAT. Well, what is it really that we're going to expect on the GMAT, and how is the GMAT actually evaluating these skills? Well, the GMAT is an exam that consists of four sections. There's an essay. There's a section that's called integrated reasoning. Now, some of the schools are going to be paying a very close attention to integrated reasoning. For example, Ivy. This is a school that's actually famous for its case method. In fact, if you go to pretty much any school in the world, you're probably going to read an Ivy case. Now, um, the majority of the cases produced in, for business schools are produced either at Harvard or at Ivy. So that is why the integrated reasoning score is going to be really important for these schools. These scores, however, in the great reason in the WA, do not contribute towards your 200 to 800 score. The only two sections that do contribute towards that score are the quant and the verbal sections. They're the longer sections. They're about an hour each, a little bit longer than an hour, and they have the most questions. Quantitative reasoning, 31 questions, two minutes per question. Verbal reasoning, 36 questions, a minute, 48 seconds per question. So really fast paced exam, really certainly fast-paced sections as well. Now, if you take an online exam, and I know some of you might be considering taking an online exam in the next little while, there is an alternative to an in-person exam right now, the analytical writing assessment section is not going to be there. So instead of writing an essay during your exam, the business school will usually ask you to write a timed essay on the special website. And then JD is probably going to talk about that as well. Now, the most important thing and the most challenging thing for most people in the quant and verbal sections is the fact that this is a computer adaptive test. Now, you, of course, I am sure you know what is a test, and I'm also sure you know what is a computer. We're sitting in front of one right now. But what does it mean, adaptive? Well, adaptive simply means that it adapts, but how exactly does it adapt? Well, the GMAT adapts the difficulty of the questions as we go along. That means if you are answering the questions correctly, the difficulty of the questions keep going up. And if we answer the questions incorrectly, the difficulty of the questions keeps going down. 
So what this means to us is if we want to get a high score, we need to make sure we see a lot of hard questions on the GMAT. Right? I, I don't know about you, but I remember in my undergraduate years, sometimes if I have an exam coming up and it's some sort of a challenging topic, like maybe particle physics, I know some questions were easy and some were really hard. So I'm hoping to get easy questions to get an easy A. But here on the GMAT, that's not going to work. The questions are all calibrated by difficulty. And the only way to get a high score is to actually do a lot of hard questions. Now, I noticed some of you are raising your hand. So if you have a question, just please put it in the chat box and I'll make sure we address your questions as we go on. If your question can wait, please put it in the Q&A box and we'll make sure that we absolutely answer it by end of our class. Now, these two sections, as we mentioned, quantitative reasoning and the verbal reasoning sections are the ones that are the most important because they contribute towards the total score. There are two question types in the quantitative reason section, problem solving and data sufficiency. Two weeks ago, we talked about them. And again, we're going to have another class two weeks from now. The verbal reasoning section has three question types, sentence correction, critical reasoning, and reading comprehension. We will talk about all three today. But before we do that, I want to ask you a really quick question. And that is, is the verbal section on the GMAT hard? Is it? Many people think that it's just an English section and therefore if I speak good English, I should be able to do well on this section. So let me know and I'll just uh, share with you what some of the, uh, some of the people are saying. Well, uh, very often we would hear, well, English isn't really my first language. So therefore it is going to be a hard section for me. Well, I think you might be surprised and perhaps pleasantly surprised to learn that many people without speaking English as a first language can do really well on the GMAT. In fact, English isn't my first language and I did very well in the verbal section and many of our students do also very well. One of the reasons why you might actually have an advantage if English is not your first language is at some point you had to learn English grammar. Most people who speak English natively haven't actually learned English grammar at any point in their lives. Uh, in many of the provinces and states in North America, English grammar is not a mandatory topic in high school or middle school. Uh, another po very popular answer, lots of grammar rules to remember. Oh my God, English language, 500,000 words, a lot of rules and even more exceptions. How can we even remember what do we need to know for the GMAT? Some of the people are saying, I got to brush up on my vocab. I usually start pulling my hair out of my head and I don't have that many because the vocab is not tested on the GMAT. In fact, English grammar is also not tested. Well, it's kind of tested, but that's not the point of the GMAT. Remember the point of the GMAT is the skill. Yeah, I need to know some English grammar, but believe it or not, nine English grammar rules, nine, only nine rules cover 95% of all sentence correction questions. Five grammar rules, five cover 80% of the GMAT question. So speaking about the complexity of the grammar, five rules, 80% of the questions. And some of you are saying, of course, what's to read, not enough time, passages are confusing and so on. And I love this. This is also a very popular answer that several answer choices work right. So sometimes the answer may seem subjective. Like we might even disagree that this is the right answer. Well, again, they only seem subjective because, because perhaps we don't know how to choose the right answer. So let's learn some of the strategies that we will need to make sentence correction more manageable. Now, in terms of the basics that are tested in sentence correction, there are actually three things. Number one, it's the grammar. Number two, it's the meaning of the sentence. And number three is the style of expressing our words in a sentence. So it's not just the grammar. Right? Grammar, again, is just the foundation. It's the basis 
on which the GMAT is going to find a way to test our skills. And again, I'll share with you what skills exactly are tested in sentence correction. So if we need to know only a small number of English grammar rules, exactly what rules do we need to know? What are some of the basic foundations that we need to know? In fact, these are so basic that many of them, if you take our course, we're going to give you access to them even before you come to the first class, because of course coming to class isn't really about learning the basics. It's about learning some of these more advanced skills. It's really about training yourself how to think differently. But what are these basics? Well, in the English language, there's a very specific rule about structuring a sentence. And that is every sentence in the English language, certainly the, the sentences that are describing something in what's called the descriptive mood, they must contain a minimum of two words that play two very distinct roles in a, in a sentence. Does anybody know by any chance what are the two words that an English sentence must contain? That's not the case in other languages, by the way. Italian, Russian, Spanish, you can actually have a sentence of just one word. But in the English language, you must have a minimum of two words in a sentence. Does anybody know what these two words are? And if you don't the answer, please put it in the chat box. Yes, yes, thank you. Some of you are saying, yeah, some of you are saying subject in a verb, verb, noun in a verb. So the first one is indeed a subject. This is what whom the sentence is about. The second, the official term is predicate, but let's just call it a verb just so that we can all understand what it is because who knows what is a predicate, right? So the verb is essentially the action or state of being of a subject. Uh, now, somebody is saying, is it okay to just have the verb and not the subject? So is it okay to just say, you know, study? So that would be a verb. Well, not really, because that would be a different sort of a sentence. Um, the sentences that are used in sentence correction are always going to be descriptive sentences, right? So there are actually three different modes of how you can create a sentence. So only the descriptive mood as a subjunctive mood is are being tested on the GMAT. Uh, the word go, the sentence go or study, that's what's called an imperative mood, and that is not tested on the GMAT. So every single sentence on the GMAT sentence correction must have a subject and must have a verb, right? So that's really important. The GMAT is going to find a clever way to uh, trick us into thinking we have a verb, whereas we don't. For example, the GMAT might uh, say, uh, let's say, Sergey is studying for the GMAT. So that would be a proper sentence because we have Sergey is studying, that's a verb. The verb is actually is studying. Uh, what the GMAT sometimes would do, especially in a very long sentence, you might just forget to include the word is, well, forget means they'll do it on purpose, of course, and the sentence will just simply say, Sergey studying for the GMAT. Now, I know it sounds silly, and we all know that's not the proper sentence, but you'll be surprised how many times most of us fall into this trap just because the sentence is very long. So we do need to make sure that the sentence contains a subject as well as a verb. However, that's not enough. Not only we need to have a subject and a verb, we also need to make sure they agree. Now, what does it mean agree? Do they just sit around the table and agree on something? Well, of course not. So they need to agree in number. There are different ways to agree, by the way, but the only way to agree that's tested on the GMAT is an agreement in number. What this means is that if you have a singular subject, you must have a singular verb. If you have a plural subject, you must have a plural verb. That's as simple as it is. All right, should be quite straightforward, right? I mean, singular subject, they just mean one singular verb. That just also means one and plural means more than one. So if you're okay with this for now, I'd like to make sure we can practice it just so that we can actually 
demonstrate to ourselves perhaps that we can use this rule, not just know this rule, right? Remember, knowledge isn't power, how we use it, that's what's power. So let me show you a few sentences. And I'm going to just launch a quick poll here so that you could let me know. What do you think is the right version of each of the sentences? I'll give you a few seconds to make a choice. All right, I'll give you five more seconds. Please make a choice. Well, let me share with you what we've decided. So as you could see, the answer to the first question is the crowd was sharing the raptors and some of you have chosen where and that's okay we're here to learn well we're talking about the crowd and the crowd by the way is uh, one crowd even though the crowd may consist of two million people and by the way if you don't know who are the raptors this is the team that won nba championship championships in 2019 this is a team from toronto and when it did win this was the first time that a canadian team won the nba championship about 2 million people went on the streets to cheer the Raptors. 2 million people, yet it was one crowd, therefore we said was and not where. Number two, Amy and Bobby live in Boston. The majority of you were correct as well. How many subjects do we have? We have Amy and Bobby. There's more than one, there's two people in fact. And that is why we need to use plural. So if you've chosen singular, then please pay attention to your subjects. It is two subjects in this case, or there are two subjects rather. Number three, Jason, as well as you two friends, most people chose take, just a very small number of people chose takes. However, the right answer is takes. Jason, as well as his two friends, takes a GMAT prep course. That sounds really terrible. His two friends takes, nobody in their right mind would speak that way, but that is exactly how the grammar rule works. In this case, the subject is Jason, as well as his two friends is an additional information. It's called the modifier phrase. So it's really important to understand what is actually the subject here. It is not Jason and his two friends. It is Jason as well as two friends. That's really, really important. Uh, and is different from as well as, I know we often use it interchangeably, use these words, but these don't mean exactly the same thing. Number four, neither her brothers nor Susan. Most people voted for have, though a smaller percentage. Now the right answer here is has, it is has. Neither my, the, no, her brothers nor Susan. Now we are talking about both brothers and Susan. But in this case, we don't talk about brothers and Susan or as well as Susan. We talk about brothers or Susan. Now the grammar rule applies equally to neither nor or either or. So I know that mean different things, but grammatically they are the same. And we talk about or that just means we're not quite sure. Could be one, could be the other. So if it's brothers, it's plural. If it's Susan, it's singular. And because we are super confused about what to use, there is a grammar rule. 
A grammar rule says if you have two subjects that could possibly be, in, be subjects, but it's not both of them, it's just one of them, then use the one that's closest to the verb. In which case, this is Susan. That is why we need to use has and not have. Number five, the board of directors has or have decided to fire the CEO. Well, again, by the majority vote, it's actually has, but a very large number of people also answered have. Now, when we speak, we usually say have, because of course it's the directors who decided not the board. I mean, how could the board decide to fire the CEO? That makes no sense. Yet it absolutely does because it is the board, just like the crowd who decided. The directors themselves are simply a part of the board. In fact, I'm going to give you a rule in approximately two minutes or maybe even less that will tell you exactly why the board was the subject and the directors were not. So stay tuned, it's coming. If you have any questions, just please put them in the chat box. All right, now, when we talk about the subject verb agreement, it's really important to remember something. And that is not every noun is actually a subject. Uh, the right answer was has the board of directors has decided not have but decided and that is why not every noun that we see is going to be a subject sometimes we're going to have nouns that are not subject just like directors subjects are nouns that have a verb and objects are nouns that don't have a verb now i know it's probably re you you're thinking wow that's really really helpful right you know that subjects uh have a verb and verbs don't. But, um, and that's why the board of directors was said, well, the board was a subject and the directors were not. That is why the board has decided, not the board of directors have decided. But that definition isn't particularly helpful because how do we understand who actually decided? So we need to go back and perhaps use some of the rules to determine what's a subject, what's an object, so that we can then figure out what do we actually need to match with the verb, right? So I'll give you a rule in just a moment that will help you break, break down what's a subject, what's a verb, right? But remember, objects don't perform any action, subjects do. Sergey is studying for the GMAT. The GMAT doesn't perform any action, Sergey does. Right? That's what it is. Sometimes when you use a passive voice, it's a little tricky. For example, you could say the door has been opened by a person. Well, I mean, who performs the action? It's the person, of course, but the person's an object, right? So it's a little bit tricky. And that's why there's this very super, super useful rule of how we could narrow down the list of our nouns very, very quickly and figure out exactly what's a subject and what's not a subject. And that's a rule of a preposition. So here's what the rule says. If you have a preposition and an example is of, in, for, above, beyond, below, to, uh, about, these are all prepositions. These are short words that connect nouns together. I'm talking about the GMAT to my child, about and to are all prepositions. What you're going to find is in order to connect a lot of nouns in a sentence, the GMAT will need to use a lot of prepositions. And of course we do the same when we speak. And what's interesting is that there is a very black and white rule. And that is, if you have a preposition, what comes after it is always an object, no exceptions. You cannot have a subject after the preposition. Therefore, when you talked about the board of directors, just because we had that word of, we immediately know the directors aren't the subject. 
So what was the subject? The only one that was left is the board. And that is why we match the verb has to the board. So this rule of a subject verb agreement is very, very useful. However, that is not the only agreement rule. There's another agreement rule that's test on the GMAT. I think you're starting to notice some pattern here is that the word, the rule of an agreement really has to do with the structure of a sentence. And it's actually one of the most commonly tested rules on the GMAT. So paying attention to the structure of a sentence, just like what we did when we broke down the, uh, the ethicist passage is what we're going to fo be focusing on a lot. So what's another agreement? Well, that's an agreement of pronouns. Now, what are pronouns? Well, of course, pronouns are very short words that replace nouns. And when we replace nouns, essentially we would say, Let's say Sergey is teaching the GMAT class because he would like to share some valuable tips because he really cares about you being successful in the GMAT. Now, we don't want to use Sergey all the time, we just say he. When we replace a word with another word, it's possible that we use their own part, right? Just like if we want to fix a car, if we replace a part in a car, we might accidentally use their own part and the car is not gonna work. The same can happen in a sentence. When we replace a pronoun, we might accidentally use the wrong pronoun. So that is why we need to pay attention to a couple of rules. And that is, firstly, we need to make sure that the pronoun refers very clearly to the noun it's replacing. So we know exactly what it means if we say he or she or it or they, who is they, who is, who is it? We need to identify this in a sentence. Therefore, a sentence will never contain a pronoun without the noun itself. Secondly, the pronoun must agree with the noun it's replacing. That's also really important. And I'll give you a couple of examples, just so that you could see how we could perhaps not use the pronouns properly and how we could. Can you please look at this sentence and let me know what's a pronoun, whether it is used properly, and why or why not? Okay, yeah, she's a pronoun, yes. And uh, is it used properly? Why yes or why not? Okay, yeah, most of you are saying no. So here, what's interesting is that we're referring to somebody by she and uh, somebody was feeling unwell, but who was feeling unwell? Well, it might be Elizabeth or might be Melissa. We're not quite sure. Elizabeth is in the hospital, Melissa is visiting her, but Elizabeth could have been a doctor. And Melissa just has an appointment with Elizabeth. So that is why here in the sentence, we can't really use she. We need to probably just use the name of a person. Okay, how about this sentence? Please tell me what's a pronoun and is it used properly, yes or no? Okay, yeah, they, and yeah, most of you are actually, yeah. Um, some of you are saying that's fine. Yeah, no problem. Uh, well, who is they? They must be a Walmart, right? But what is Walmart? Uh, I mean, we very often would refer to Walmart as they, because we refer to Walmart either as Walmart people or Walmart stores. I'm gonna go to Walmart, they have a sale today. No, nobody will say, I gotta go to Walmart today. It has a sale. Say, what do you mean it? 
what exactly has the sale? Oh, it's Walmart. Oh, you mean they have a sale today, right? So I think you, you're kind of getting the point now is that we don't really talk very good. And that's why we can't really rely on how things sound in order to answer the GMAR. Because Walmart's a company. It's a name of a company. It is one Walmart. Therefore, I love shopping at Walmart because it has good prices. Nobody will ever speak like this, but that's grammatically correct. Unless we say I love shopping at Walmart stores because they have good prices, who they? The stores, right? So that's the agreement rule. The first one was she, there was a reference rule where we needed to make sure we refer correctly to the right noun here. This is an agreement rule because they doesn't refer properly to Walmart. Walmart was singular, they was plural. Can you please tell me in the first sentence here, what's the right pronoun? Is it you and I or you and me? Is the GMAT class for you and I or GMAT class is for you and me? Yeah, some of you are saying you and me, some of you are saying you and I, and I would usually hear, well, you and I, because it's you and I, that's proper. And, you know, you've probably heard a lot of songs, you and I, yes. But see, the interesting part is both I and me could probably be correct because both I and me are acceptable pronouns. Now, the difference between them is I is used as a subject and me is used as an object. And if we're not quite sure, well, let's just put it in a sentence without the you. Right? Why, why should we focus on something they have in common? Because if we need to make a decision, we need to focus on what they have different. Right? And that's a skill that we teach a lot in our class. It's really focusing on the differences because that's what helps you make a decision. So let's get rid of you and let's just look at I. This GMAT class is for I. And we, we're not even going to talk like this. The GMAT class is for me. So if we focus on the differences, we know the second option is right. How about the second one? Who or whom is this class for? What do you think? Yeah, some of you are saying who because this is how we always speak. Some of you are saying whom is because probably that is right because who is probably not correct because that's how we always speak and we don't talk good, right? Well, I mean, if you want to have an easy way of figuring this out, simply answer this question. The answer is going to be they or them. So what's the answer to this question? Well, of course, it's for them. And if the answer is for them, we should use whom. And if the answer is for they, we should use who. Who is studying for the GMAT? Who came to the workshop tonight? And they came. Therefore, who was used properly? For whom is this workshop? It's for them. Therefore, them is the proper version. So it's just a quick brain hack. And of course, the difference between the who and whom is the difference between the subject and an object. But of course, we don't need to remember it. We just need to remember this quick hack. All right. Well, I hope you're enjoying it so far. I would like to challenge you a little bit here by giving you a question. Uh, this is a real question from a past exam. I am going to give you approximately one and a half minutes to try to figure out what is the right answer here. And then we'll talk about this question.
All right. Uh, well, it's been actually two minutes by now. So thanks for voting. I'm gonna give you 10 more seconds to choose an answer. And please let me know in the chat box, why did you choose this answer? What was the reason why you chose that answer versus any other answer? I give you five more seconds, five, four, three, two, one, and that's it. All right, so let me share the results with you. So as you could see, the majority of the people chose C. Um, and uh, I can only imagine that uh, many people may have chosen C because C uh, sounds the best. I mean, if you read every other answer choice, it sounds really weird, but C sounds the best. That's why most people actually choose it. Well, uh, one of the things that I uh, would like to invite you to notice is that so far we talked about the agreement rule. I haven't really taught you any other strategies. So it probably would be unfair for me to give you uh, questions that might test things we haven't learned yet. And if you read the original sentence, you may have noticed a very tiny little word, it. That is why when we read that original sentence, which by the way is the same as the answer choice A, we get, especially if it has worked well in the past, makes it likely to miss signs, um, interpret them when they do appear. So there are a bunch of pronouns here, but most importantly, the pronoun it. What actually makes it likely? What is it? I'm not quite sure. So answer choice A is wrong. How about B, an executive who has heavily committed to a course of action, especially one that worked well in the past, makes making signs of significant trouble, misprinting ones likely when they do appear. Okay, what is they? It is uh, maybe the signs or uh, maybe the course of action or misinterpreting ones. We're not quite sure what is they here. So B is also wrong. How about C? An executive who is heavily committed, that was the most popular answer. Let's see if it's right. Or maybe at least if we can find any problem with it. An executive who is heavily committed to a course of action is likely to miss or misappropriate miss signs of incipient trouble when they do appear. Okay, sure. Especially if it has worked well in the past. What is it? Again, there is no clear reference to the pronoun it, therefore C is also wrong. How about D? Executives being wow, heavily committed to a course of action, like what is actually committed to a course of action? Executives being like a human being or executives being? So that definitely has the wrong meaning here. And then again, we have especially if it has worked well in the past. So D is very clearly wrong. The only answer choice that's left is E. I know E sounds, perhaps sounds terrible being heavily committed to a course of action, but the pronouns here are out. There isn't really any problem, any other problem we can spot. And that is why E is actually the right answer to this question. So when you are analyzing sentence correction, the most important takeaway so far is don't choose what sounds right or looks right or feels right. What's really tested in sentence correction is attention to detail, clarity of communication, and really the mastery of this process. It's really all about the skill of this process. It's not about knowing something specific. Right? It's about paying attention. It's about knowing some rules, yeah, for sure. But beyond that, it's about paying attention, focusing on how we can make a decision really quickly how we can go through these passages very quickly and answer these questions within about just maybe over a minute. Sounds really easy, right? I wish the GMAT were this easy. Yeah, I wish it were. Uh, what do you guys think about this sentence? Is that a correct sentence? What do you think? Yes? Some of you are saying yes, some of you are saying no, some of you are saying we should choose the, probably the GMAT was right, just because the GMAT is a test. We don't say GMATs. I'm gonna start preparing for my GMATs. No, that's not the right way of saying this. 
GMAT is a test. So it looks like we should use was. However, that is a perfectly written sentence. Yes. So you remember we said that there are actually three moods on the GMAT. There is a descriptive mood, which is when we simply talk about something that is happening. This is how most of the sentences are written. There's also an imperative mood, which simply says, pay attention, study for this test, be quiet. Right? That's not tested on the GMAT. But this is the third mood that's called the subjunctive mode that actually talks about something that's not necessarily true, but it's something that we believe. And in this example, instead of saying was, we will say where. In fact, we'll say where regardless of what we're talking about. If you ever heard the phrase, I wish I were you, well, why do we say where? Why not was? It is because of the subjunctive mood. Right? So it's a rule that's not as commonly tested, certainly doesn't belong in the top five or even the top 10, but it is tested on the GMAT occasionally. And that is why I just thought it would be a fun thing to mention here in this workshop. So the question is, how do I really get good at this? How do I practice? I gotta practice a lot. Yes, learning these rules is important, but believe it or not, I taught you the rule of a pronoun already. And I taught you the rule of a subject verb agreement already. So now the time is for us to develop our skill. And we'll develop our skill by practicing a lot. We'll develop our skill by, as we practice, by seeing what works, what doesn't work, by getting some feedback and by continuing to improve. So many people are asking me, well, what kinds of resources should I use for the GMI? How do I actually practice, right? And I always say, well, practice comes second. Learning comes first. Once you learn, then you got to practice. But when you're ready for that, once you learn, where would I practice from? Well, there are a few resources. First of all, the GMAT official guide is a really good collection of questions from past exams. I, uh, it, this is the book that has excellent questions with the most terrible explanations. And that is because the explanations weren't really written in order to teach us something. They're simply explaining why this is right, right? More for kind of explanation theoretical purposes rather than actually to teach you the strategy of how to do this question. Well, if you come to our class, we're also going to be giving you another book which contains approximately 500 questions that are mostly challenging. Because if you come to our class, it is a 700 plus class. So that means we gotta focus a lot on the challenging side of the GMAT on more difficult questions. Also, when you come to our class, we're going to be providing you with a platform that you could use. It's a very sophisticated, adaptive platform that helps you practice your questions and really do a lot of, um, a lot of different practice quizzes and exercises just so we can get really, really good at doing the GMAT. You'll be doing some practice tests. You'll also be doing a lot of practice quizzes. There are over 5,000 questions on this platform. And it's included with our GMAT mastery program. But for some of you who already perhaps have been studying a lot and you feel like you know everything, but you still are not there, all you might need is just some practice. Or maybe you worked with a private tutor or maybe you took a course somewhere else and you're looking for what's really missing. That might really be the missing ingredient. And today we have a very special offer. We pretty much never have this offer all throughout the year, but we have this platform available for half the price. Now, normally we provide maybe about a 25% discount throughout the year, but we never really provide a 50% discount. So I do suggest that if you, if you know that what's missing is a really good practice platform, then uh, grab to that platform because it won't be available at that discount, um, at least for the next year, for sure. So you can get it for half the price, which will give you access for six months for only 299 Canadian or 249 US. Uh, it does include some video reviews. It's a fairly extensive knowledge base, uh, four practice tests, uh, full length CAT exams, as well as a lot of questions, literally, like I mentioned, over 5,000 questions. So you can go to adminmaster.com slash offer. You're going to find this promo code there. And as long as you book until Sunday this week, the code expires at midnight Eastern time on Sunday, then you are going to be able to take advantage of the sale. So I do really very highly recommend you look into this. Uh, unless, of course, you join our live class, in which case this platform is going to be included in your fee. 
Now we spoke about sentence correction. Let's talk about critical reasoning because that is something that is scary for a lot of people. Critical reason is all about arguments. And the question is, what is an argument? Now, many people, when they think about arguments are thinking of people arguing. And if I ask you, well, have you seen people arguing? Usually that involves two people trying to prove something to each other. However, on the GMAT, it's usually going to be one person who's trying to prove something to other people. And if we want to argue effectively, we need to have two things. We need to have a conclusion, which is also called a claim, which is, by the way, how we started our class today, we said, oh, at the very beginning of that exercise, we had a I have to give you another example, just to, again, make things a little more relevant to what we're doing here today. I attended an awesome GMAT class today. I take my preparation seriously. I make the right decisions. Therefore, or as a result, I will get a high score on the GMAT. What is my point? What is my claim? What's the main idea of this argument? That is, all I'm trying to say is I will get a high score on the GMAT. That's my point. Why do I believe that point? Well, I need some evidence. So what's going to be the evidence? That is, I do take my preparation seriously. I do make the right decision. I'm the kind of person who makes the right decision, gets the right support, shows up to the right class. Therefore, I will get a high score on the GMAT. That's it, that's my argument. I present some evidence and I present my conclusion. My conclusion depends on my evidence. So as you are analyzing arguments that you're going to see here on the critical reasons question on the GMAT, you will very often need to understand where's my conclusion, where's my evidence, and then sometimes the GMAT is going to ask you to do something with those conclusions and evidences. So let me show you a question, and I'll give you exactly two minutes to work on that question, and then we'll look at this question together. So here's the question. When you're ready, please choose an answer. And I'll give you exactly two minutes. I'll give you 15 more seconds. Please choose an answer and we'll talk about this question in just one moment. All right, so as you could see, the most popular answer is B, and then we have E as the second most popular, nobody for A, a few people for C as well. 
So let's go back to this passage and let's look at a, a couple of different ways of dealing with it. One of the ways which a lot of people do when they approach this passage for the first time or similar passages, they'll say, okay, how do I do this? Let me read the passage, let me read the question, let me read the answer choices. And initially it's a little hard to understand what's going on. So perhaps I should read this more than once and see what answer choice looks somewhat familiar. What is the answer choice that actually gives me something that's about what I just read. Some of the people are gonna say, what's the answer choice that's in scope for this passage? So let's take a look. Well, A says bronze ceremonial drinking vessels. I'm not quite sure how it's relevant. So it sounds really weird. B says most modern histories mention the earthquake near the island in AD 365. Well, we're talking about the earthquake, we're talking about AD 365, we're talking about Cyprus. So that looks good, that seems familiar, that's in scope. Then coins, statues and inscriptions all look weird. We can probably, if we had more time, we can go back and reread the question. We can reread the answer choices. We can make sure we really don't understand what's going on and we'll pick B anyway. And after about three to four minutes, we'll just say, okay, forget it. Let me keep going next, right? That's what most people do. So I've given you just two and a half minutes, but most people are gonna spend about three to four minutes and most people are gonna pick B. Now, I don't know if B is right. We're gonna find out in a moment, but that's probably not the right approach because we need to be a little more confident. So perhaps we can begin by learning the rules. If we already determined that sounds right is not really the strategy we want to use, perhaps we'll use some rules. Well, here's an interesting rule is let's read the question first and figure out what type of question is this? Well, this is going to be a question that's asking us to strongly support the hypothesis which means that's a strengthen question. Now in a strengthen question, we're going to try to strengthen the hypothesis, strengthen the claim or the conclusion of the argument. So we'll read the passage, we'll identify the conclusion and the evidence. So what's the evidence is we have these debris and collapsed buildings. What's the conclusion is that this town was destroyed by an earthquake in AD 365. So we are going to be looking for an answer choice that makes this conclusion stronger. Well, let's see which one will do. Does A make it stronger? Not really. I mean, it doesn't seem relevant. Drinking vessels, what do they have to do with the earthquake? How about B? Well, B tells us most modern histories mention there was an earthquake. And we're looking for some proof, some additional proof that that earthquake actually destroyed the town. So yes, that looks like it's gonna strengthen it. C, D, and E all seem quite irrelevant. And therefore most people who've learned the rules are going to confidently pick B after about two minutes and move on to the next question. So notice confidence is really important. By the way, confidence is a really important secret ingredient. When you are doing your GMAT, it's really, really important that you keep your confidence at all times high when you are going through the test. And even though we actually chose the wrong answer, it doesn't really matter because we were confidently choosing the wrong answer. So congratulations if you were confident. However, B is not the right answer. Even though we learned the rules, we still pick the wrong answer because the GMAT isn't about knowing the rules theoretically. It is really about, again, developing the skill, developing the mastery of the process. So how can we master this process? And what exactly will we do here if we did master this process? Well, what we're gonna do is, yeah, indeed, we'll read the question first and we'll identify that that's a strengths in question. And then of course, yes, we will also read the passage. We'll identify the conclusion and evidence. Yeah, that's very important. But here's the thing. What is the evidence that we have here? Well, we know that the town was likely destroyed by an earthquake just because there's this excavation and that's what we've determined. We also know that there was an earthquake in 8365 because at the very end of the argument, we have words known to have occurred near 8365. What we don't know is whether this town was destroyed by that earthquake. That's what they hypothesize. They say the town was destroyed by this earthquake in AD 365. That is something we're trying to prove. And because that's something we're trying to prove, that's not something we know for sure. So we don't really know if the town was destroyed by this earthquake. 
We do know the town was destroyed by an earthquake. We also do know that, that there was an earthquake in AD 365. We're just not quite sure what earthquake exactly destroyed the town. So we are going to be looking for some additional evidence that tells us it was this earthquake destroyed the town, not some other. So by saying that that earthquake destroyed the town, we're actually assuming there was that earthquake. So we're gonna work with our assumption here. Let's see, what helps us understand which earthquake exactly destroyed the town? Does A help us with that? Mm, not really, doesn't really do anything. How about B? Well, B, most of us chose B because we felt like it gives us some relevant information. However, B just simply restated what we already saw at the end of this paragraph. That is why it cannot be the right answer. I mean, we already know this. We're looking for something new. How about C? Well, C tells us that after AD 365, there were no coins, but before AD 365, we had a bunch of coins. What this tells us is that it's very likely that the town was destroyed that specific year. And that is why if we know the town was destroyed by an earthquake and we know there was an earthquake, and we also now know that the town was destroyed in that year, we can pretty much safely say, or certainly with a higher degree of confidence, there was that earthquake that destroyed the town. And that's all we need to do. We just need to support the hypothesis. We need to make the hypothesis more believable, essentially, and that's exactly what we did. And because there's only one right answer, and once we've chosen C, we can stop. We don't have to keep going anymore. All right, well, I hope you enjoyed that question. And the most important takeaway here is that once we master this process, we can be given pretty much any topic and we can answer the questions correctly within a fairly short time if we, if we know what we're doing, if we really focus on the process of doing the questions. Of course, we don't need to know anything about archaeology or Cyprus or whether there was actually an earthquake, right? Whatever we need is given to us. Now, here we've seen that the passages are a little bit longer. The sentences are usually quite short. The critical reason passages are longer, and of course, the reading comprehension passages are even longer. So we go from short to longer. And I want to ask you a question. And this is a rhetorical question. You don't have to answer. I know the answer. Do you get super excited about reading comprehension? I know most of us, when they see reading comprehension passages, we would immediately say, oh my God, how am I gonna deal with it? So much to read, so little time. And that is because we don't really know how to read properly. When we read, we try to understand what's going on there. And if it's something about, let's say, molecular biology, and we have it, let's say, history background or a mathematics major, we have no idea what it's talking about. So we all really get worked up and really get nervous. Whereas all we needed to understand is how the author was making a point, not what the author was saying, how the author was saying. That is why we don't need to know anything about that subject matter whatsoever. Instead, all we need to do is focus on how the paragraphs in the passage create the narrative. That's really what's important. What's the storyline behind it? How was the passage structured? So reading for the structure is a very important skill. We have a lot of, we're spending a lot of time in our class actually teaching you how to read properly, right? Because we're gonna be reading and paying attention to different things of how we normally pay attention what we normally read. So how do we actually begin reading? And I know some of you are already in our class. Some of you are going to come to our class a little bit later. But you can begin learning how to read differently even now. As you read, you're going to be asking yourself a series of questions. The first question is, how is the passage really organized? What's the purpose of each of the paragraphs? Not necessarily what the paragraph was saying, but what was the purpose? Maybe it was to introduce a new theory. Maybe it was to talk about the problem with that theory. Maybe it was to introduce an alternative solution. Right? What was it? Then you also want to focus on what's the passage about? What would be a good title that we can write for that passage? For example, that's a passage on a certain piece of theory and uh, different implications of that theory. 
We're also going to be paying attention to the author's tone or emotion behind the words. Was the author neutral or positive or critical, or maybe the author was overly biased? And most importantly, what was the primary purpose of the passage? Why did the author write this passage? Why exactly did the author choose to write it? Was it to convince us of something? Was it to entertain us? Usually not on the GMAT. Was it to explain something to us? Was it to do some critical analysis? What really was it? If you answer these four questions, and if you take notes as you go along, after each paragraph, what was the purpose? What title would I give it? What was the author's attitude or emotion? How did the author actually relate to what we're talking about? That's going to help us a lot when we answer certain specific types of questions where we need to agree or disagree with the author. And finally, why exactly did the author write this? What was the reason? And it was never, by the way, to make our life miserable in the GMAT. That's not why these passages are written. They're all real passages from past exams. Sounds pretty easy, right? But it's all doable. And I could tell you, regardless of whether you're struggling with verbal or with mass or with both, you could do very well on the GMAT. In fact, uh, here's another example. Uh, we had uh, this, a client who came to us actually about six years ago. He already graduated from his MBA in 2016. Um, he was really trying to find himself at that time and he did really well in his MBA program, participated in the economist case competition, got the second place and then worked in management consulting firm, and now he has his own business. So when he started, he had a relatively good verbal score, well, actually a very good verbal score because he was already in the top 1%. He was able to improve it even higher to 47. 47 is really an exceptional verbal score. And his quant score also went up from 33 to 48. What's interesting about Alex is that he had a music background. He was playing in a band, a very gifted musician, but a terrible mathematician. He learned the patterns of the GMAT. He learned what's behind the questions. He learned how to read and pay attention to the questions. He was able to do exceptionally well, got 760. In fact, uh, he got a full ride scholarship at the school where he went. So it is possible to develop these skills. And, and the amount of effort that you put in will translate into what score you're going to get. And the question is, what score do I actually need? You know, that's a really good question because not everybody needs a 700. We would love for you to want 700 when you come to our course because that will improve our average, right? The more people who really want to commit it to 700 and we know we can teach you how to get 700, but of course the commitment has to come from you as well. Well, if you're applying to some of the top US schools, then the average scores are going to be well in the mid 700s. Top Canadian schools, uh, the changes from year to year, but it's usually approximately the top 20%. That's an average score. And of course, the average score in the GMAT is only about 560. And only 12% of people who take the test will achieve a score of 700 and um, the rest of the people won't. And in fact, I like to sometimes play this little game and you may have played this game with me before when I ask how many people actually get scores of 700 on the GMAT in terms of the percentage. And my answer is actually 0.3%. And you might be asking, well, why is it not 12%? Because if 70, 700 80 is 80th percentile, doesn't it mean that 12% of people get a score of 700? Uh, well, yes and no. It depends on what people they use as a base, right? So that's a common trick that GMAT's playing in the uh, quantitative section. Because every year, about 7 million people decide to study for the GMAT. 2 million people actually register on MBA.com in order to take their GMAT. The only step that's left is for them to pull up their credit card number and actually register for a test. Out of these people, only 10% will do the test, 90% won't. And of them, only 12% will actually do the test. I, I find it quite shocking. And it is one of the reasons of why we see that pattern is because most people don't really know how to study for this test. They study for the test by just memorizing all of things or they don't have the right support. In fact, I'm gonna give you an answer right now. Of what's missing for most people and why do one in 300 people of everybody who decides to study for the GMAT 97% of people won't even do the GMAT, ever. I mean, of everybody who registers on MBA.com, 90% of people don't do the GMAT. 
So if you wake up this morning and you decide, oh, it would be a good idea for me to do the GMAT, the chance of you actually getting 700 plus score is one in 300. Probably can win a lottery uh, with better chances. And if you actually go on MBA.com, create a profile, enter your name, all the information, the chance of you actually doing the test is one in 10. Simply doing the test. Right? So of course we want to improve these chances. So what's missing for most people? Why do a lot of people, why are a lot of people not committed to follow through, to go into the program? And JD is gonna talk a lot about some of the life-changing experience that the MBA program is going to bring you. And of course the GMAT is the first step. And by the way, it's not just a hurdle, the GMAT is actually teaching you the skills that are gonna help you succeed in the MBA program. Remember we said it's all about the skill. So what's missing for most people? Well, I like to use quotes and analogies and I gave you some already. So I'd like to use a quote from Tony Robbins and uh, I'm sure you know who this person is. It doesn't really need an introduction, but Tony said, and I've been to many of his workshops, is that, uh, as, and of course we already know this by now and we talked about this, that knowledge isn't power. Knowledge is a potential power. If you have knowledge, it doesn't really mean you master something. Many people have the knowledge but few people are successful. What really helps you master a skill are a few things. Number one, it's learning from the experts. Because yes, I could figure out how to do something, right? When I learned how to sail a boat, I went on a boat with somebody who knows how to sail a boat. Now I can go on a boat myself and I can crash the boat and it's a $20,000 boat. So how many times can I do this before I can learn? How long is it gonna take me, right? But instead, I'm going to learn from the experts first, and then I'm going to try myself. At first, I'm going to watch them. Then I'm going to try myself. And as I'm doing this, I need some coaching because I know even though I just watched them do this, I'm not going to be successful myself because I've never done it before. And I might panic. I might stress out. I might not react properly. So I got to get some coaching. And I also need the right structure and the right plan. I don't want to go in the big ocean-sized boat 50 footer if I've never sailed in my life, right? I want to go maybe on a small boat with some small wind. That's why when you come into a class, we're giving you the structure so that you're starting from some of the things that are a little more manageable and then you're building up to a skill that helps you get a score of 700. So that's what's really important, right? So if you want to write this down, that's how you get outstanding results. If you commit to this process, learning from the experts and you might have a really good friend who scored 780 and can actually teach you, and that's great. Uh, if you don't, then come to a class. Get some coaching, make sure you have the right structure. Now, some of the classes provide just one of these themes or sometimes a couple of things. And sometimes the plan is a very generic, like a 30-day 30, 30 study plan. You know, sometimes so we're all different, right? So we're starting from different things. We have different strengths and weaknesses and different, different availability. So, we need to make sure that your plan is specific for you. That's so when you come to our program, it's a six or 12 week program. You are going to be in a fairly small class. It's gonna be a lot of fun and it's very interactive. It's different from the class we're doing today because this is a one way class, right? You can, the only way you can interact with me is by chat box. In a real class, I'm gonna teach you, be teaching you a class, but you'll be doing a question back to me and we'll be doing some interaction. We'll be playing along and uh, we'll both be on the webcam. Uh, and if you come to our class, it's really a one-stop shop. We made it so easy for you to make a decision. You're going to have all the study materials. You can come and retake the classes completely free for one year. Uh, we know you're going to need individual help. So we're going to give you three hours of personal tutoring and we'll be coaching you until you are done. As long as it takes for you within that year and nobody actually takes more than a year. I've had some of our clients approved from 200 to 700 in six or seven months. So, uh, Nobody needs a year, right? I've seen people improve close to 500 points. So it is possible, definitely. And some of these people had a learning disability. So it's doable and it doesn't take as long as, as, as some people actually do. If you go to some forums, you'll hear some inspirational stories how people studied for like four or five years. Sometimes when I see this, I really just want to say, well, don't you just come and take a GMAT course, right? Or just give up. Right? That's persistence. But you know, there's a limit to persistence, right? I don't want to study for the GMAT for five years. I probably want to have other more enjoyable things in life as well. But of course, our goal is to help you enjoy your experience as well, because it is a learning experience. You're coming to our class to learn. And the only way to learn is to have fun and challenge yourself a little bit. So it is going to be a challenging experience. 
but I can guarantee you're going to enjoy it a lot. Now, there are a couple of options. And for this year, we don't have any more classes left because it is December 1st. So uh, we don't want to start the class before Christmas and you get disrupted with your Christmas shopping. So our next class is going to start on January 5th, right after the new year. Now, the good news is you can register for this class right now. And as long as you register by this Sunday, you are going to be able to save $200 for that class. It is already over 50% full. It's a very popular evening class. And all you need to do is just make a $500 deposit to book your seat and you can pay the rest when the class starts. The next weekend class, if you prefer Saturdays or Sunday, if you are in some of the other parts of the world, let's say maybe you're in Europe and uh, the evening class here, North American time is not gonna work for you, then taking a class on a Saturday and Sunday in the morning might work better for you. And we still have that offer as well which is $200 off. So essentially it is an unlimited training for a flat fee. And uh, we have a lot of people who come to our class who are saying, I've already spent so much money on the GMAT and we'll say, look, we can guarantee that this is going to be it. You're going to learn all the skills. We had Lori, she actually came to our class in around May. She's already worked with a private tutor for over a year. She spent close to $10,000. And then she came to our class and said, in two weeks, I learned more than what I've learned uh, working with a private tutor for a year. Now, we typically offer classes in person. Unfortunately, now, because of the pandemic, our classes are fully online, but they are online interactive. So you can take these classes literally from anywhere. When the pandemic ends, we are going to continue online classes as well. Our classroom is equipped to teach both. So therefore, we, even when we teach a live in-person class in several cities uh, here in Canada and the United States, our classes are going to be broadcast and you're going to be able to fully participate. We have had to equip our classrooms for, uh, so it actually, when you are taking our class, the instructor isn't a real class, just there are no students. Uh, we've installed all the equipment. So it's a high definition, everything's broadcasted. You're going to be able to see the classes. All the classes are recorded as well. So you'll be able to see recordings uh, either of your class or of the past class that's exactly the same. Yes, so the classes are online, so it's super, super convenient. You don't have to go anywhere. Now, we talked about this uh, two weeks ago, but if you were to try to really combine everything that we provide you in this class, it's about $4,000 worth of different materials. Uh, most importantly, the live class, and we're not even talking about repeating the class. If you start repeating the classes, then um, that could really add up quickly. Uh, and uh, you're also going to be in a community of other people who are studying in the same time. So it's really good to be in a study group with other people who are helping you a lot. So our class, if you do register for the January classes right now, it is going to be $14.99 Canadian or $11.99 US. And all you need is a $500 deposit to book your seat. This, no, the course is from uh, everywhere. And in fact, we have a lot of students from Mexico. In every class, we usually have a couple of students from Mexico. Uh, we usually have about 60% you know, of people from uh, Canada and uh, about usually about 30% of people from the US. And then uh, we have also people from all over the world, usually about one or two from Mexico. Sometimes we have people from even New Zealand, uh, Malaysia, uh, Bangladesh, uh, Argentina, Brazil. So you can take this class literally from everywhere in the world. We have a student right now in our class uh, from Greece. Uh, we have a student from Portugal, from Italy. Um, as long as the timing works for you and we have an evening class and the morning class. So if you're in Europe, then the morning class is going to work for you. If you are in Mexico, then any of them is going to work. I, uh, this, this is uh, going to be really a game changer course. And uh, we had a client recently who was taking our class in the middle of the night. And I asked her, you know, why do you go through so much effort? And she said, I was searching for a class like this for probably six months and I couldn't find anything. And finally, I, I found your course online and I came to this uh, one of these workshops and said, that's exactly what I need. She signed up and she was literally, she was waking up at 1 a.m. in the morning to take our classes. And she said it was a complete game changer for her. So absolutely, you can take uh, our class and, uh, it, it, and we'll give you all the materials regardless of where you are in the world. Now, the most important thing is we want to have, we want you to have a return on investment. And of course, return investment is going to come from getting into your dream business school. And I do have to tell you that uh, we've been doing this now for over 10 years. Our company has been around since 1998, but we've been teaching this specific course for 12 years since I joined um, this class about, or about 10 years ago, 10, 12 years ago. 
And the, we've seen a lot of our students getting scholarships. So the average scholarship that our students get is about $15,000. So imagine investing $14.99 and you know that is, that is really it. You do not need to budget for anything else outside of that. It is really going to be it or $11.99 US and you're getting an average about 10 times in your scholarship. So really good return investment. Sometimes you can get even more. For example, Diane came to us about a year ago. She ended up with 170,000 US dollar scholarship. So she sent me an email, I was just chatting with her a few days ago. She's like, this was the best decision of my life. She said, I came to a course, I spent $1,500. We helped her with the application as well. So she spent about four or $5,000 with us in total. She got $170,000 scholarship. So thinking about a good investment, right? So it really does matter how you study. We do keep track of the success of our students. Our students improve on average 180 points. So the average score is 670 among our graduates and about 35% of our students achieve scores of 700 or more. In fact, with the online courses, now we find that Let me try to fix it. Okay, thanks so much. Yeah, uh, it's, uh, there was a problem with my audio. So Fion, uh, Fion said, I need 600. And she called me seven months later and said, I just got 760. Oh, wow, Fion, how did, you, how did you manage to do this? She said, well, look, you taught me all the right skills. I just continued practicing. And I figured, why not? I'm going to continue. You guys provided me great support. And I, I just continued using resources. And I'll study until... Uh, I'm uh, happy with my score and she ended up with a score of 760. She called me and said, what can I do with this amazing score, right? So if you're really committed to get a 760, we can help you, right? That's, the, that's really the place. So we have these special offers and actually we've extended them. Normally they're just for a day. We've extended them until this Sunday. So if you go on our website, adminmaster.com slash offer, you can save $200 in the January course. And remember, you just need to make a $500 deposit. If you are interested in complete self prep with no coaching, this is the best deal of the year. It's not gonna be back. And once it expires on Sunday, that is it. We might not do it next year either, but this is just, we've decided to help you out to study at home. You're gonna save 50% of our self prep options. You'll find everything online as well. So guys, I know you're gonna have to learn these strategies somewhere. I'd love to be the one or our team, we have a really an amazing team. I mean, my score of 750 is the lowest score and I have the least experience. I've been teaching the GMAT only for 10 years. So I have the least experience of all our instructors. Everybody has been studying. They've been teaching the GMAT for more and they all scored above me, right? So just to talk about, that's why I get to talk here with you and kind of entertain you a little bit because all of them are working teaching classes, right? So you're in for a real treat. So come and join us in our virtual GMAT classes uh, and uh, we'll make sure that you get your score and also you have a lot of fun. Here are the schedule of the next classes. Now, if you are still exploring, you want to come to our master refresher, then please do come on Tuesday, uh, this, uh, this coming Tuesday, uh, actually two weeks from now, uh, December 15th. And uh, again, we'll send you a link tomorrow to register. And we're doing this workshop in partnership with the Ivy Business School. So JD is going to now share a few strategies with you. So you can go on ivy.trygmat.com to take a practice test and essentially you'll find all of this at admitmaster.com slash offer. Well, ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome JD Clark, Executive Director of Recruitment and Admissions from the Ivy Business School. He's gonna share with you some amazing strategies. I'm going to unshare my screen right now. And all I'm gonna do is I'll stay behind, I'll answer your questions. And if you want for me to get in touch with you, then um, just, 
either get back in touch on our website or just answer this question in the poll. And I'll make sure that uh, if you are serious, I'll, I'll make sure that I call you or email you in the next 24 hours and we'll have a chat. Thanks so much and please welcome JD. Yeah. Hey, Sergey, thanks so much and uh, pleasure to be here. Um, so it's a good distraction. I was outside shoveling. Uh, we had a big snowstorm in London, so I was uh, shoveling uh, the snow. So uh, and uh, luckily I finished it just in time to, for this. So I'm going to I'm going to share some slides with you. And basically what I want to do with our probably 20 minutes together is give you uh, some strategies and admissions tips and tricks. So as you think about maybe applying to MBA programs, uh, how you should approach the decision, how you should look at um, you know, deciding amongst the programs, but also give you some tips generally about Ivy and what we look for in applications, but really it can span MBA programs uh, in general. So uh, this is, I won't go into my background and, and such, but this is my LinkedIn. So you can get familiar with my background uh, and uh, where I came from. But also I, I think what's really important is on LinkedIn, I, I post several uh, articles, not only about Ivy, but MBA programs in general. So I'd be happy to connect with you uh, on LinkedIn. And as well, I'll put in the chat box before we leave and Sergey will also provide you my email address as well. So happy to keep in touch. Um, I came across this TED Talk video a couple of years ago and I think it really, really resonated as we do work with candidates on, on the decision to do an MBA program. And really that's how we view our job here at Ivy is to help you with a decision. Whether that's to do an MBA program or not, or whether that's to come to Ivy or not, it's really about providing you valuable information of approaching the decision to do an MBA program. Uh, Ruth did this talk, a TED talk called How to Make Hard Choices. Ruth's background's pretty interesting. She was a, uh, did a philosophy undergraduate degree, loved it. And then, you know, because of pressure thought, what am I gonna do with a philosophy degree? and actually went and did a law degree, practiced as a lawyer and didn't like it at all. Went back and did a PhD in philosophy and her area of focus is really this aspect of how do I you know, make tough decisions? She talks about three things in this video that I think are really, really relevant in her talk about when you look at MBA programs and, and really the decision to do an MBA or not and how you should choose amongst different schools. The first is she, she defines what is a hard choice. And, and really, you're going to find this when you look at MBA programs. It's really a hard choice is anything it boils down to where you do a pros and cons list. Because a hard choice is one alternative is better in some ways and the other alternative is better in other ways, but neither is better than the other overall. And you're going to find that when you do an MBA program. It's a hard decision. The second thing that she talks about, which I really, really encourage you to kind of keep a check on as you think about doing an MBA program is when we're faced with a difficult decision, we tend to default to the easiest decision, not necessarily the best decision. And really in this whole thing, the easiest decision is maybe not to do an MBA program. So you talk about Sergey's stat of how many people register on mba.com because they're thinking of an MBA program and doing a GMAT and 90% don't follow through. I mean, that's really relevant. This is a really difficult decision. And sometimes as humans, when we get overwhelmed, we take an easy decision. So I'd really encourage you as you think about doing an MBA program, make the better decision, not necessarily the easier one, and really do that gut check. Am I making the best decision or am I kind of defaulting to the um, easier one? The third thing that she does is she gives a, a really sort of framework on how you approach a difficult decision. And it really says that you gotta start with that question of what matters most to you. And you know, once you kind of come up with what matters most to me, it becomes easier to evaluate the alternatives. And so I think that's uh, really, really important to kind of keep in mind. I'm going to talk about rankings because rankings really fit with this whole element of what matters most to you. So, so there's lots of stuff about whether you should look at rankings, lots of information around that. I do think rankings are important, but I think they're really important to evaluate the components of the rankings. So what happens with these rankings is they take survey data, they take data from the schools, and it all gets rolled up to an overall ranking. And at Ivy, we're really proud of, we are number one in Canada with the Financial Times, we're number one in Canada with Business Week as well, but we're more proud of those aspects that matters most to us, which I'm going to talk about uh, next. But I'm going to show you why it's really, really important to kind of look at components of the rankings, and I'm going to use Financial Times as a benchmark for it. So one of the things Financial Times does is they go out and survey uh, alumni. So these are individuals that three years out and all rankings publications will survey alumni. 
And they ask them various questions. And one of the questions they ask, and I just use this as an illustrative example, is the effectiveness of career services. They also collect data from the schools on, on you know, corporate social responsibility as core courses. And we don't have it as a core course. We actually weave it in all the courses because it touches strategy, accounting, finance, leadership. They also look at the faculty that are published in the FT50 academic uh, top journals. They also, there's a lot of programs, particularly in Europe where a second language requirement is required. In Financial Times, you get extra points if you have a second language requirement. What you will find with most North American and Canadian schools, a second language is not required, but very, very common in European schools. Uh, they will look at international advisory boards. So at Ivy, like many schools, we have an advisory board made up of alumni. We have international uh, you know, advisory board members, but we also have Canadian advisory board members. But in Financial Times, you get points if your advisory board is 100% international. And then you also get points if the percentage of female faculty members of the school is 50%, not 49, not 48, has to be 50. So all of these bottom, so if you think about, and, and I ask this in, a, in a, a live forum all the time and say, what's the most important? Everyone will say the effectiveness of the career services. And don't forget, these are people being surveyed three years after graduating. That's worth 2% of the overall rankings. All of these combined are worth 20%. So the reason I share this is as you look at rankings, it's really important that you dig deep in the rankings and look at the various components and especially the components of what matters most to you. I'm gonna share with you what matters most to us at Ivy. And quite frankly, it is comes down to the quality of the education experience we deliver, the impact that education experience has on individuals' careers, as well as what recruiters think of the talent coming out of our program. That is really our key, key priorities and what matters most to us. So in that whole element of career services, uh, we are ranked number one in Canada by Financial Times. Again, that's our alumni three years out. We are also ranked by economists three years in a row. Economist goes out and they actually survey a recent alumni, ask them various questions. They rank the top 100 schools globally. We rank in the top 10 out of those 100 schools globally. And we've done that three years in a row on what the alumni thought of the education experience that they delivered. Same rankings, four years in a row. Same, uh, we, they ask a question about, you know, what's your assessment of the career services in the program? We were ranked in the top 20 for four years in a row. This past year, we were uh, ranked 16th. Uh, Business Week does a ranking every year. Again, they rank, uh, they ask various questions. They, they do surveys of alumni that are out of the program for a while, people that just completed the program. And they also ask questions about recruiters. And this whole ranking of networking and, and Business Week does two rankings. They do one for just US programs and one for any, what they call their international MBA rankings, which is any program outside of the US. But when you look at this score for networking, which is based on um, you know, what the students thought or the recent alumni thought about their interaction with alumni, what alumni think of their interaction with other alumni and the whole network in the school, and they also ask recruiters about what they think of the talent coming out of the program. When you look at that score for networking, you combine those two rankings, which is about 131 schools, we are ranked uh, number 15 uh, MBA program globally for networking. So again, really encourage you and actually ask the schools, what are you most proud of? And also make sure that aligns with what you're looking uh, for to do out of an MBA program. I'm gonna talk about who we look for in an Ivy MBA. And I'd really encourage you, not just about Ivy, but any program you're kind of considering, never ever self-select yourself out. Because one of the things that happens is you think, well, I'm not really an MBA program candidate. I will tell you, I did my MBA. I did it later on the older end of the age range. And, and really I did that because I have a history degree. I was in a non-business background. I actually worked at a university. So it was like, I'm not really got a business background. I don't think I'm a candidate for an MBA program. We are looking for tomorrow's leaders and leaders come from all different backgrounds. So, you know, we've had individuals that are professional musicians in our program. We had a wine sommelier last year. We've had a chef, high school teachers, lawyers, people that served in the military. So really, and, and not only just the industries they came from, but people from fine arts degrees, arts degrees. So I'd really, really encourage you never ever self-select yourself out of a program. And, and it's really important that you, you go in with it. You don't wanna lose the opportunity to get into a great school that you're considering just because maybe you self-selected yourself out. 
I'll give you a sense of our program. Uh, we have about 150 to 155 students each year. So relatively a small program in comparison. Um, it's very international in nature. So we have 25 different passports represented, 24 different birth countries. By the nature of Canada itself, uh, we have about 50% of our, our class, uh, you know, uh, our class that were born in Canada, 50% outside of Canada. About 30% of our students actually come in under student visas. So they're immigrating to Canada, particularly for this program. Average age is 28, uh, 24 to 35 is the age range, about five years of work, uh, average work experience, two to 10 is the range, and then 34 different industries represented. On our website, we have more class profiles, but I really encourage you when you look at class profiles, sometimes people go, well, there's not many people like me. Again, never ever self-select yourself out. Again, that diversity is really, really important to have in that classroom. I'm going to talk about our application process again, you know, you're going to find every MBA program a little bit similar on it. But here are the five things that we look at in the application. I know they are numbered on the side. This is not in the order of, of importance. We look at files on a holistic basis, but we ask for a minimum of two years work experience. So after graduation, you've worked two years, professional level work experience. I'll talk about what that means. But what do you mean when you think about leadership experience and potential? And how do you convey that? And so I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about references. Each school look at a little bit different, but I'm going to give you some advice on, on the references and, and uh, what to look for. Talk about your previous academic experience. We do look at the GMAT or GRE. About 10 to 15% of our class uh, coming in will we'll look at the GRE. I'm not going to talk much about that because Sergey went through it. And then I'm going to talk about the admissions interview and give you some tips and tricks. So work experience. Again, we look at the two years minimal. Uh, minimum work experience post-graduation. Again, we're looking for professional level work experience. Really, it brings diversity and adds value to the classroom and, and team learning. In our program, there's going to be two ways to look at your work experience or convey it. There's an online application, and you're going to find this. Most programs will have an online application. And for most programs, this is where you would describe, you know, they'll ask you sort of chronological when you had this job. And you're gonna put a book, few bullet points in about what your job description is. So what are you responsible for? What are sort of the key metrics that you had? A lot of programs will ask for a resume or they will ask for a letter of intent. Um, sometimes it's a little bit different, but really you gotta make sure in the application process, wherever it is. And for us, we ask you to do this in the resume is really put accomplishment oriented. So what are you most proud of? What impact did you have? And, and how well you did your job? So I think one of the things I, I really give a tip, when you think about applying to an MBA program, it is really easy when somebody says, what do you do on a daily basis? Oh, here's what I'm responsible for. But when they ask you about, you know, what are the accomplishments you're most proud of? What impact did you make? Sometimes that takes a real reflection. It, you know, by nature, we tend to be humble. And so it takes some reflection. And, and, but that's really important to kind of convey in your application. For us, we ask you to do that in the resume. For us, again, programs are different. Some of them ask you to fill out a template for the resume. We don't ask you to do that. We don't keep you to a page limit. We want you to have that opportunity to describe your experiences as much as you possibly can. So what we don't do is kind of keep you to a page limit. You're applying to an MBA program, not a job. So we want to make sure that you have that room uh, to convey it. Here's some things to think about highlighting. And again, these are examples of what you might include in your experience. So I wanna talk about, because leadership experience and potential is not necessarily you are leading people. It's about the experiences that you have. And so here are some things to include. Again, you don't have all of them, but think about them. Think about those times you've shown initiative, the ability to get things done. So if somebody asked you in an interview or in a questionnaire, like, what are those things that you accomplished, those projects you were involved in that you're really excited that that came to completion and you're really proud of? Your ability to self-manage, your ability to figure things out yourself is really important. Where you brought big picture thinking in, teamwork. Teamwork's really important in an MBA program. And you can think about teamwork in a couple of ways. It's where you worked in teams, where you maybe you struggled with teams and worked through it where you were generous with team members and supported them. So those are some of the things to look at. Persuading and communicating. A lot of examples I suggest to that is when somebody had an idea or maybe an analysis that they did that brought an insight and they had to sell it. And so where you had to persuade and communicate. 
making and assisting decisions. And I put assisting in there on purpose because a lot of times people will say, well, I don't really make decisions. And I hear that often, you know, I'm not really at that level where I make decisions. So then I'll ask the question, well, do you suggest, make suggestions? Oh yeah, all the time. Do they act on them? Yeah, most of the time. Well, then you're making decisions. So think about those times where you, you made a suggestion, somebody acted on it. And the last one's pretty obvious. It's, it's around solving problems. So where have you had to solve problems? So again, these are some things as you think about those impact and accomplishments of some of those things that you wanna highlight. References, um, different schools have different references. Some schools ask for letters, some have forms they fill out. What we do is we have a form that the references fill out. Those references will fill out a form. They will ask them certain character and abilities of you to rate you on that and some open-ended questions. How it works is when you're in the online application, you fill out your references information, you click a button, you actually execute sending it uh, to them. You can actually see the form ahead of time. Who to select for references? Um, and again, each school is different. Our only requirement is that one of those references be professional in nature, either in your current employer or, or past employers. Sometimes people wanna keep it confidential in their current employers. And it has to be a peer uh, or a peer colleague or as well, maybe somebody you reported to. The best advice I have about the references, as you think about those experiences you wanna highlight in your application and through to your interview, admissions interview, select references that, that observed it and that you work close with. Some of the biggest mistakes people will make on the references is they'll choose somebody that may have a big title but didn't really observe you. And then we get the reference and the reference is sort of like, well, I can't really comment on this or, or it's very short. So you wanna make sure that the references add a lot of flavor uh, to your character and abilities. And as much as you can align it to the experiences you're highlighting in the application, the better off you are. It's really important you meet with your references. And I really suggest you meet with them, you talk to them about why you're doing an MBA, talk to them about the experiences that you're highlighting in your application, provide them with a deadline. Each school is different. Um, we, we don't need the references when you submit the application. We tend to like them to follow within about 10 business days afterwards. So about two weeks afterwards, but they can arrive after the submission deadline. We can proceed in evaluating it for interview stage, proceed with the interview, but we need them uh, for the final uh, decision. So again, really important as you kind of talk about it, talk to the schools about what the reference requirements are. But the biggest advice I have, no matter where you apply to, is make sure that you have references that have observed your character and abilities enough that they can provide meaningful and substantial, uh, substantial uh, commentary. Previous academic experience. Um, I will tell you that another reason to be quite transparent that I waited to do an MBA till later is I really had very poor grades in my undergrad. So I did an undergraduate degree in history. Uh, it was something that I really enjoyed going through high school and then I went to university. I really enjoyed it in high school, did not like it in university. So uh, I was also young, uh, immature, didn't really focus on the studies. Uh, so it wasn't an indication of, of the, my academic capability, but it was more of the program that I took. My daughter, who's in grade 12 right now, I can tell you from the day she's probably started grade nine, the push to get great marks means you get into a great university. Um, you know, and there's always that thing when you're in university, there's no way you can do graduate studies unless you get uh, good grades. When you apply to MBA programs, we have a tool like the GMAT or GRE that can showcase your academic rigor and can balance out weaker grades. So we have a class average. Our class average is B level mid 70s. I think last year was 78. Uh, so that's about a 3.5, I think on the GPA. Um, but that's our average. We have no minimum GPA when you apply to the program. And again, if you have marks that are below average, we're just gonna put more weighting on the GMAT. So that's really important uh, to consider. So again, it doesn't negate you, doesn't make you to stop. It just makes sure that you have to provide a strong GMAT score. So for me, I knew I had to provide a strong GMAT score to be successful in the admissions process to make up for having poor grades. The other thing we look at is program of study. So I did a history degree. I had no quantity. I think I had an arts stats course, a basic stats course, but on my undergraduate degree, I had no quantitative courses of study. So when I did the GMAT, I also had to give a good GMAT uh, quantitative score to kind of balance out that. 
So if somebody comes in with engineering, we'll concentrate maybe less on the quantitative and more on the verbal section. So again, the grades that we look at are the most two years of your most recent degree. So we don't look at first and second year if you did a four-year undergrad. I did a three-year undergrad, so they looked at my second and third year, uh, again, which were not great. So that's really important to kind of leave is there's no minimum GPA. So again, back, don't self-select yourself out because you got poor grades. Just make sure that you put in the effort on the GMAT or GRE. We will not look at the grades if you come in with a strong GMAT score. So uh, that's really, really important to consider. We ask for two essays. We do video essays and you'll find most schools have video essays and most schools have written essays. So I'm gonna give you some tips around that. The video essays, we use a platform called Cura, which about 90% of the business schools use. You have the opportunity to test the technology ahead of time. So, I mean, a lot of us now working from home, we know how it works with the webcam, but you can kind of test it. We have test questions. You can kind of make sure that it, it kind of goes well. So you can test it, leave it, come back when you're ready to do it. So really important when you do it, how it works is we have about a bank of 50 questions. You're asked two of them randomly. You're given 30 seconds to prepare an answer and a minute to get your response. These are not technical questions. They are like getting acquainted questions. So I'm gonna give you an example. One of the ones we use is you're all of a sudden you're given a, a day off. What, what would you do, right? So what would you do with your time? It takes about 15 minutes by the time you get settled, but give yourself 30 minutes, give yourself a quiet space, dress professionally, treat this as a job interview. So make sure that you dress professionally. Being nervous is normal. Uh, you know, we're asking you to think on your feet. So nerves is very normal. And again, there's no right answer. So these are like getting acquainted questions. We use the video essays because it allows people outside of just written essays to bring their personality uh, to play. And so that's really important to kind of get to know you uh, on this level and allows you another opportunity to present yourself, not just in the, the written application. Written essays. Um, we ask two written essay questions in our, in our application. First one is make sure you answer the question. And, and I think the best way to do it is you're gonna give this to proofread to somebody. And I really suggest that you do that because sometimes we get so close to our answers, give it to somebody to proofread. When you give it to somebody to proofread, don't give them the question, just give them the answer and, and then ask them, what do you think the question is? That's the best way you can do to make sure you answer the question. The other advice I have about the written essays is that write it for an audience of one. So we have an admissions committee tomorrow morning. When I'm prepping for that, when I read the files coming in, I'm reading the essays individually and so are other members of the admissions committee. Then when we review it for the admissions committee, we're reading it on an individual basis. It also keeps it personal. So imagine when you're writing the essays, you're, you're writing it for an audience of one. It, it helps you keep it personalized, but it's also how many people will read your essays. They will read it on an individual basis. Here's the biggest mistake. Um, you know, you're trying to fit everything into a limited time on the video essays or the word limit. Again, this is a snapshot. And what you have to do is, is you're gonna go through an interview stage where you're gonna actually talk about this more and be able to, um, you know, describe your experiences more. I love using analogies, so I'm gonna use one here, is that it's like the trailer to the movie. So if you think about a trailer, it's about three minutes long, the movie's two hours. You know, and whenever we're on Netflix, I like watching the trailer. Oh yeah, I'm just getting the highlights of it, right? And then you watch the movie and you get the whole sort of uh, plot line. So treat your essays as the trailer and the movie is your interview. I, I think the, the big, biggest piece of advice, be clear, be concise, be creative. That's totally great as well. But most importantly, be yourself. And, and the biggest mistake I think sometimes people make on the essays is, well, I'm going to write this way. This is a a cool experience I have, but not really a deep experience, or I think the admissions committee wants to hear this. And if you go into the interview stage and the interviewer asks, well, talk more about what you talked in the essays, and then they start probing it. If it's not a deep experience for you, then your story collapses, right? So really, really make sure, most importantly, be yourself and, and make sure that they are those meaningful experiences for you. Interview tips. Uh, so how we do the interviews, again, each school's uh, different, but we, we actually have members of our career management department do our interviews. And, and so the picture there is Brenda Pearson, who's one of our career coaches. So the career coaches that you will work through within the program actually do the interview. And the goal of the interview is to make sure that there's a mutual benefit here. We want to make sure that for us, that the program fits with your career goals. So that's, you know, it's also a you, an opportunity to talk about your career uh, goals and 
and talk to, to the school and, and sort of evaluate that fit. We're also looking to evaluate, will you meet recruiter expectations in that program? And so that's really the purpose of our interview. So we get to know your experience more. Part of interviewing is storytelling. So it's really important that you're prepared. You have bullet points, but you're not scripted. So sometimes the worst thing is people will have, you know, their script out and then they'll point it out and they'll read from it. And that becomes very obvious that's happening. So be prepared, but not scripted. When you practice with somebody else, practice storytelling. It's really important to be yourself. You know your experience better than anybody else. That's the best mindset you can have going into any interview, whether it's for an MBA program or for a job. You know your experience better than anybody else in that room. So your job is to make sure you highlight those important experiences that you have. Make sure you do your research on the program. The interview is not the time to ask basic questions of the program. The expectation for all programs, you've done that research ahead of time. And that's part of our job is to get you prepared that you know enough about the program, get you prepared for uh, the, the interview. And also make sure you ask intelligent questions for your interviewer afterwards. So again, for us, it's somebody in career management. So many of the questions happen, you know, how does career management work in the program? How do you support, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But make sure you have some questions uh, prepared for it. Some frequently asked questions. Uh, this is probably the number one, what has been the impact of COVID-19 on our program? So just to share with you, we were virtual uh, from March the 17th. Uh, and, and in fact, our program starts in March. So it was about a week afterwards uh, that the program had to go fully virtual. We were fully virtual until August the 10th. And uh, just where we are in London, Ontario, we're doing uh, well with the cases, all, all considering, and we are able to have students back in the classroom. What we are doing is as long as COVID is around, we are doing what we call a hybrid approach. So we have students joining virtually and, and again, students that will join in person. And the reason we do that is for safety. So again, we are not an online program. We will not be an online program. Our goal is to get 100% in person as soon as we are able to do so. But we have to be virtual uh, for, you know, do this hybrid approach to make sure that uh, for the safety of our community, which is really important. Our program that starts in March is we are planning to go ahead with that hybrid approach. And then eventually with the news about vaccine and such is to transition to 100% in person as soon as it is safe to do so. Do I have to apply by each deadline date listed on the AVI website? The answer is no, we do have deadline dates there. The two deadlines to kind of keep in mind, if you're an international student, we need to have your application by September, our deadline in September. Just generally about the third week of September, if you're a domestic student, our deadline is that first Monday in January. So those are sort of the last dates, but you can apply when you're ready. Um, and so what we don't do is, is kind of keep the applications for a deadline, review them all at once. We have rolling admissions and review them as they come in. Really, really important. And again, for any school that you apply to is really keep people up to date on your application timing. I think that's really, really important. An application timing that, you know, that maybe you need to get a decision expedited because you have offers from other school. Maybe you get an offer from us and you need to make sure that you extend that offer out. What's really important to us, we want to make sure that you have all the information available to make a decision. And all the information being available is you have all your offers and scholarship information from other schools. Um, are my chances of admission scholarship greater if I apply during the earlier rounds? Again, important to ask this question to any program. The answer for us is no. We treat everyone the same for scholarship funding for the first person that applies to the last person that applies. That's really important to us as a school. It's also really important to alumni that fund our scholarships. So uh, that's important. And then the types of admission scholarships offered, they're based on merit. So the overall strength of your application. Um, and, uh, you know, about 75% get scholarship funding. The average award amount is 30,000. The range of award is 10 to 70,000. And you find out about the awards. Again, each school is different, but you will find out the same time you make your admission uh, offer. So again, never make a decision on a program until you kind of know every program you're interested in, your shortlist you've applied to. Uh, and you know the decision and the scholarship. So really important to kind of time your applications, but keep the schools informed of it. Final thoughts. I think it's really important you connect with each school. We're here to help. Never ever apply to a school without talking to them first and them getting to know you. And our goal is that we get to know every candidate by the time they apply, 
by the time they go to admissions committee meeting. And, and that's to benefit you. We are here and every school I have people like myself and people, you know, I have, I have, uh, we have three recruiters that kind of work directly with candidates and every school has that role. And it's really important that they're, they're there to help and, and really help you put your best foot forward. It's really important to get to know the culture of each school. You know, not only are you doing the academics, but a big part of this is sort of the makeup of the school. What kind of atmosphere is it? Is it competitive? Is it not? What's, what's sort of the cultural aspect of the school? It's really important to talk to current students, um, you, you know, get a sense of, of the culture and, and make sure that it fits for you. When you think about what matters most to you, you got to have stuff in there about the culture. That's really, really important. Align your application submission. So make sure that the timing, so you know, you apply for all your programs at a similar time. And again, be thoughtful about your final decision. It is lifelong. I'm gonna leave you with this last quote because I think it's really important. One of the things I love about my job, and I, I've had other jobs, and, and I can tell you there's a very big difference between liking a job and loving a job. But what I love about this job is I feel like I'm in the dream business, right? You know, I mean, people come here but it truly is doing an MBA, you're one decision away from a totally different life. I think about all the alumni I've seen come through the programs and, and everyone come through the program. It is a truly transformative experience. And so it's really important when you think about this, it is a lot of money, it is a leap of faith, but I can tell you it is one of the best investments that you can ever make in yourself, both personally and both professionally. So here are just some, uh, some links. I'll leave it on that for a little while, but happy, Sergey, to take any questions or anything else to uh, uh, anything that I can do, so. Thank you so much, JD, for, uh, for sharing these strategies and these tips. We there have is one a question that came in. I can take it now, so I can. Yeah. So Sarah had a question. If only one reference needs to be professional, can you give an example of who to provide as a second reference? So you can have another, um, you can have another professional reference. I, I think, you, you know, our only requirement is you have one, but you can choose two. Our, our only requirement is you have two references. You, you can actually add more if you'd like. But I think when you think about references, think creatively as well. I, I'm gonna give you an example of a reference I saw recently, like probably last year, which I think is one of the strongest, like one of the most creative. And I, I mentioned this as an idea that, so this individual coached, um, uh, young girls soccer team. So girls that were eight to 11. So soccer, football. And actually one of the references was from a parent uh, of, of somebody that she coached on the team. Talking about her leadership style, the impact that she had on the team. And, and it was an incredibly powerful reference. And, and so I think one of the things is you think about references uh, for an MBA. And again, you'll see the forms, but you're gonna have people that immediately come to mind, oh, I'm gonna send it to this person or that person, but also think about some of those individuals that can provide uh, some reference information. So again, it's very open-ended on who to choose, but it doesn't mean that you can only have one professional reference. You could have three professional references uh, if you want. So thank you, Sarah. Um, thank you, Judy. There's actually a question here in the chat box. I submit the resume and got the answer that might be a good fit for an executive MBA could I still apply to a full-time MBA? Yeah, so a full-time MBA is more designed for individuals that are that two to 10 years of work experience. And, and that is not, and, and, and you're gonna find this in pretty much every full-time MBA program. I mean, we do a lot of panels as Sergey knows in the various MBA fairs and, and such. So every program is designed for a different stage you are at in your career. The reason why it's two to 10 years in, in, in a full-time MBA is twofold. One is you wanna make sure that people are in the same stage in their career. So one of the things you don't wanna have is, is somebody that might be more experienced and with more junior people, especially in our environment that's more case-based. It actually is also really based on recruiters' expectations. So recruiters, when they recruit from an MBA program are really looking at a, a certain uh, stage that people are in their career. So you're gonna find um, in a one-year program, we tend to go to 10 years of experience. So you'll find our programs one year. So we, we tend to go uh, a few years uh, past uh, what many two-year programs tend to be around that two to eight mark. And, and their average work experience tends to be, you know, around four years versus ours, which is between five and, and six. So hopefully that answered your question, but 
each of the programs are different. Same thing, we, we have a master's of science and management. It's a pre-experience program. So again, that's designed for individuals right out of their undergrad that don't have work experience. So the programs are different depending on the stage of, of career people are at. Perfect, thank you so much. And again, um, if, if you are not sure, you could take a look at uh, the profiles of different people who come to the program, but most importantly, get in touch with the school and, and have a chat and, um, and maybe get an honest opinion uh, of not just um, maybe why you're good, that you are a good fit, but why exactly would you be a good fit? Because if the school also believes that certain programs are the right fit for you, then they might, it not, might not be just because there's a certain kind of list of check boxes, but it's because for where you are in your career, a certain program might work better for you. And ultimately it is a big decision for you. It's a big investment. So the school wants to make sure you are successful, right? Just, just like when you come to our GMAT program, we want to make sure you are successful. When you come to an MBA program, the school wants to make sure you're successful to achieve your career goal. So that's really all, um, is, is the ultimate goal. That's what it comes down. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, okay, there's a question uh, from Julia. Do we have Do a part-time part program? program? Um, so, so we don't have what I would call a traditional part-time program, which is, you, you know, a three-year sort of, there are different takes on it. So do we have a program that you can do while you work? Absolutely. We have our executive MBA. We also have an accelerated MBA for business graduates. So this is a one-year program for individuals that have a business uh, degree uh, that are based in Toronto. Uh, and, and both of our executive MBA and our um, accelerated MBA are in Toronto. So those are the only options that we have that you can do while working. Um, many schools have what the, you know, a more traditional part-time MBA program is, you know, you have to take 20 credits in a span of about three and a half years, it tends to take, and you can kind of pick and choose mm -hmm. on it. The only thing I would, I would caution people when you think about doing a part-time program is it is a longer commitment. And one of the things with professional schools, so law school, business school, dentistry, medicine, anything like that, the credits aren't portable. So we, we sometimes will get people that call up and say, I've done a part-time program and now I wanna kind of transition. Can I get you know, credit for my credits? It is very hard to do that in an MBA program. So I think um, that is, um, that's incredibly hard to do. So again, I think when you start a part-time program, especially one that you got to make sure that you're committed for that time frame to kind of see it through. Um, so for me, I could never have done a part-time program because, you know, I know myself, I would have taken maybe a term off because I got busy at work and maybe not come back. Right. So I appreciated the structure uh, of doing a program. So again, uh, but, but each school is different. I, I know in Toronto area, Rotman has a part-time, uh, Schulich has one, McMaster has one. So there are lots of options out there. So somebody, I'll have nine years of experience when I'm planning to apply for classes starting in March, 2022. I work in automotive domain, software development, looking for a career change, is it too late? No, it isn't. I mean, I mean, you're within that range, but I would suggest if you look at, send your resume for preliminary assessment, that's the first step. And the reason we do this is, we want to make sure if it's not a fit, we'll tell you right away that maybe it's not this program, but that program, but that's the biggest thing. And again, as we kind of go through the process, um, you know, especially in the interview stage, we want to make sure that we have a discussion with you to learn more about your background, but also your career goals. Um, you know, 91% of our class last year, and, and it's generally anywhere between 90 and 95%, depending on the class, make a career change. We measure career change on on really uh, three dimensions that, you know, you've either changed your geography, your industry, or your, uh, your geography, your industry, or your, um, uh, your, uh, your function. And, and so about 95% will change at least one of those, about 85% will change two, and about 75% will change all three. So it's, it's a big reason why people do an MBA program is that career change. There's another question from Julio. In a sense, how many credits do you have to take to be considered full-time? So each school is different on how they do it. So it doesn't come down to sort of a credit aspect of things. 
Um, but a full-time program is more defined in the fact that you are taking what they would call a full course load, depending on what the program defines as a full course load. So, so really it depends on how each program defines what a full-time uh, program of study means. To give you a sense, our, both our executive MBA and our accelerated MBA qualify for full-time full program of studies. That's why we don't call them a part-time. You're, you're able to do it while you work, but by the university and by the government, they are classified as full-time programs of study. Perfect. Uh, thank you. Yeah, no problems. All right. Well, I don't see that we have any more questions. So again, thanks so much, JD, for joining us tonight. No problem. Anytime. I always appreciate it. So. Uh, and there was a nice welcome break from Shaveling Stone. I know. So I, I, when I first logged on, I looked, my hair was all over the place because I had a hat on. So, but yeah, we got a big snow dump in London uh, over the last 24 hours. So the first one of the year. So, yeah. Uh, it was nice. It was good to get fresh air and exercise. Yeah, exactly. Get some oxygen. That's right. what we need to, so. uh, to keep us going. So when he was studying for the GMAT, make sure you also go. Yeah, the build, in the build in the exercise. So exactly. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, all right. So thanks again, everyone. Now, hopefully we'll see you in the next couple of weeks. If you did ask for us to get in touch with you, then we we'll absolutely will. Please look for an email tomorrow. We will uh, share with you all of our contact details and as well as JD's contact information so you can connect and uh, really get that process started with the preliminary assessment. You can send in the resume. Uh, we'll also remind you about our offers tomorrow as well. So get the process started. This is the best time to start thinking about the next steps. Many people start thinking about their New Year's resolutions in January and give up by February. Well, maybe start now and already build enough momentum so that you can actually follow through and not be like 90% of people who give up and never do it. So with this, I'm going to put in the chat box, Sergey, my email address as well. Yes, that so, would be great. Please. Yeah. There you go. So okay. thanks so much, Sergey. Always a pleasure to join you on this. So always appreciate the opportunity. So um, thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you so much, JD. And I'll yeah. put my contact information as well, um, just in case uh, if uh, you want to get back in touch with me directly. And here's also the link where you can find these offers. And uh, I think somebody has just one a quick question. Yeah, are we going to get the recording of the webinar? Yes, uh, you will. We are going to share this recording. Uh, it's, uh, it's a Zoom recording, so it will be available for seven days. So if you need to come back to any of the parts of this seminar, you can review it for the next seven days. Well, thanks good. everyone good night. and thanks again uh, it's been a pleasure being here with you this evening and i look forward to seeing you shortly yeah thanks good to see you. thank you